Today, we are having a boot camp on boundaries. Michelle Ellman is a master practitioner, a master hypnotherapist. These accolades are more than just a job for Michelle, they're personal. I died when I was 11. I had 15 surgeries before the age of 19, a brain tumor, a puncture intestine. So thinking and having been told that you could die pretty soon, what are the key ways that that changed the way you live and your mindset? I would even go as far as to say that people pleasing can be quite manipulative. And it's actually just nonsense. If it's something that's so easy, then why are we all struggling with it? The reason why women have been trained to communicate indirectly is you can't live your life scared you're gonna die every day or scared of anything. How can we practice self-love daily? Your inner voice is not yours. It doesn't belong to you. It's someone else who taught you that. You cannot profit off someone loving themselves. You can profit off someone hating themselves. Being in a relationship will not fix your loneliness. So how would you recommend someone sets boundaries when they're dating? So do you think too many people are settling when it comes to dating and relationships? The reason why people settle is What is up guys and welcome back to the podcast. Today we are having a boot camp, okay? I hope you're ready. I hope you're feeling enthusiastic. I hope you got your notes app out. We are having a boot camp on boundaries and the importance of setting boundaries, especially when it comes to dating with self-worth, with general relationships, with relationships with your friends, in your life, all of that. I thought this episode, we just recorded it and I felt like I'd had an absolute pep talk on boundaries and how important they are and how we need to be setting them more and how much they just generally improve your life. So I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready to learn. I hope you are ready to have a full on pep talk. This was very much a needed episode and I'm going to be taking these learnings away and very much implementing them because I feel like we always just slip sometimes with our boundaries. Like it's very easy, especially as women, when we're taught to be less direct when we're communicating, it's very easy to get into a pattern where you just slightly slip away from your boundaries. So no more. Today's the boot camp. I hope you enjoy it. As always, if you do enjoy it, please make sure to rate, subscribe, like, I literally don't know what app you're on, so I can't actually help with what you should be doing, but whatever it looks like you should be doing, it would be really helpful if you could do. Um, and that helps us get great guests on and have amazing conversations. So thank you so much. And as always, have a wonderful day. So thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. I feel like, I feel like when I heard that I was having you on, I was like, maybe I should just use it as like a life coaching session. <laughs> you know, when you're having a particularly hard week and you're like, I would like, to sit down and just have a good old like natter about all my problems. Yeah, I feel the same way. That's why every life coach has a life coach. Just really? So I feel the same way this week, especially. Well, it's like therapists have to have a therapist, don't yeah. they? And life coach don't. So it's not a protected term. So we don't have those kind of rules. But I just think it's good for your mental health. And also you become a be better life coach because I think if you don't practice what you preach, then what's the point? And mm. if you don't have your own, then there's a reason why you don't, you aren't practicing what you preach. Yeah, that's so true, actually, because it's really easy to tell people one thing and do another but yeah. then actually you know being able to give the best advice is probably from being able to have learned from those things and wanting to continually improve right because I think you could just rest on what you're already qualified in like I've already done a psychology degree all of that stuff but actually continuing to educate yourself even if it's just self-educating through books and things like that I think increase your ability to help new clients because you always want to be you don't have to be perfect that's a really big thing in life coaching I believe is you don't have to be a perfect human and you don't have to have your life sorted but you do have to be five steps ahead of your client otherwise you can't help them mm. yeah no that's so interesting I'd like to before we get into some of the meteor topics which I know we have a lot to talk about today um I'd like to start at the beginning just in terms of so people can get a bit of background on you could you tell me a little bit like I guess like a whist whistle stop tour of I guess how you even got to your career now? Yeah, so I grew up in Hong Kong and then I came over here for boarding school when I was 11. Um, and I guess the biggest part of my childhood is I grew up in and out of hospitals. So I had 15 surgeries before the age of 19. And unfortunately I've said this so many times that people say I sound like I'm reading a grocery list of like apples and oranges, but the 15 surgeries are from a brain tumor, a puncture intestine, obstructive bowel, cyst in my brain and a condition called hydrocephalus. So it was a lot of, traumatic near-death experiences yeah. um, and thankfully my last uh, surgery and hospitalization was when I was 19 but I guess that created a lot of how I live my life of because course. everyone knows you're going to die but to actually live with the emotional realization of that and especially when I was 19 in those two surgeries I had then I actually thought 
this is it. So that's how I started writing my first book mm. was I, it had been an English project when I was 12 years old, when I was in year eight and to write an autobiography. And I was like, I can't leave this earth with nothing because in my mind, studying was the process to get to the thing you want to do with your life. And I was like, wait, so I would have gone through education for nothing then. Right, yeah. So this book ended up being like my legacy for my family and friends so that like, I didn't just stop existing one day and that they would be able to think, see how, what I thought about back then and what I cared about and all these things. But the problem is once you finish a book, you want to publish it because you're like, I've written 200,000 words. Right. I need it to be seen. Um, and that's what got me onto my author journey. And along the way, I, I've always been passionate about psychology. I decided I was going to be a psychologist at 11 years old, sitting in a hospital bed because I met a psychologist through uh, being in the ICU and psychologists would come around check on your mental health all of that and that's when I decided I was going to be a psychologist and I guess where that took a turn was when I was in university in my third year I got PTSD from my medical situation mm. so the last time I went into hospital was my second year of university and then in the third year uh, that PTSD kind of brought up all my issues from 11 year old sort of younger but 11 year old is when I had my most major surgeries and I then went to therapy for the first time and it was that ironic moment of I'm doing a bachelor's degree in psychology I want to be a psychologist I've known this for a decade but now I'm sitting in a psychologist's office and this isn't helping me so what do I do next mm. and so I graduated having no clue what I wanted to do and but I knew my mental health was not in the place it should be and where I found a solution because at the time, if I'm being really blunt, I was crying every day for like six mm. months and graduating in that headspace is not ideal because no. I had known what I'd want to do for a whole decade. Right, and you're like, suddenly, why now? Yeah, I was like, great. So I finally got the qualifications. So yeah. I'm meant to be moving on to a master's. But as I said, I really believe in practicing what you preach. And I was like, how am I meant to be a psychologist knowing it didn't work for me? And at the time I felt a lot of guilt, I guess, around saying that, T talking therapy didn't work for me. And I think now we are much more open to the fact that there are other holistic ways to view things. And it's quite a well-known fact that especially when it comes to trauma and PTSD, talking therapy can sometimes deepen the neurological patterns by talking about it more, which mm. is why I was getting that feeling mm. of walking out of a psychologist's office. And I felt worse than when I'd walked in. And there's a cliche saying of like, it's got to get worse, get better. But by the time it had been four months, I was like, it's not getting better. Yeah, no, that's so interesting. That is such an incredible story. And I can imagine that having that experience of being in and out of hospital and having so many major surgeries at that age, like if you're not going through something as traumatic as that, which obviously the majority of people thankfully aren't, yeah. you're not, you know, you know, people die and you know, you're going to die, but there's not this kind of real realization I mean there's not even at my age now there's not even mm. like any time really until you're like until you're probably in your kind of 70s onwards there's not this real kind of being affronted with being like oh this is very finite our time here is short yeah. and actually you know all of the trauma that comes with that especially if that's being kind of imposed on you so quickly and to such a strong extent that you as a teenager are being like you know will I make it through the surgery yeah and I think especially one of the things I've thought about it is like especially when I was 19 a lot of people assume that they're gonna live to 90 mm. so a lot of the life lessons I got weren't just things that my friends didn't know or understand but probably won't know and understand until the end of their life but there's this natural assumption that your life is going to be long and in many ways I'm now having to actually learn that because I've acted like life right. is so short, right. which obviously leads to problems like burnout or putting too much pressure on yourself. I'm now actually having to like wake up and remind myself, life is long, you're still alive, you're 30 years old, you yeah. thought you'd die at 21, but <laughs> you're still alive, you've got time, nothing has to, you can't do everything in one day and everything can't just happen today. And like ha you wake up every morning thinking, that's it, that's it, like, and that's kind of how I did live my life, which is quite understandable why I ended up getting PTSD because of thinking course. your life is so limited and short does put an unnecessary strain on your mental health. So thinking and having been told that you could die pretty soon at 19, what are the key ways that that changed the way 
you live and your mindset? I think it um, meant I attacked life with quite a lot of... I don't know what word to use because it's been it's been said with many different ways. And I attack life very aggressively, essentially. And I've always been told with anyone I work with that they've never known someone so efficient because it is that feeling of my time running out all the time. Um, but I also think it's things like I find it really difficult if I hang up a phone call and someone doesn't say I love you because I have the thought in my brain of what if that's the last conversation we're ever going to have, which sounds lovely in some ways but also probably means you're living your life with a lot more fear and I I think my learning process through the ages of 19 and 23 24 which was really when I found my feet again after PTSD were unlearning that you can't you can't live your life scared you're gonna die every day or scared of anything to be Mm. honest and a lot of my drive was coming from fear and now I try to create drive around what I love rather than being worried about something or scared of something. Mm. And what about the positive shifts in terms of mindset and in terms of like, you know, I think probably we all need a little bit of a reminder Mm. to actually live our lives. What are those kind of shifts that you had? I remember shortly after I came out of hospital when I was 19, it was actually Valentine's Day. And I came out on the 11th and 14th was obviously Valentine's Day. And stereotypically, and the previous year, we had all the single girls had got ice cream out and sat around watching Bridget Jones and being sad about being single. And I remember that year, I was like, we're not doing that this year. We're not wasting 24 hours of our day being sad because what, we have no love in our life? That's absolute nonsense. We have love. We might not have romantic love, but we have platonic love. And why are we all being miserable together when we're literally sitting next to people who love us? And so I, um, they, I think they indulged me that year because I had just come out of hospital. So we did, we did a quadruple date with all the single people on the corridor. And it was things like that where I do think you're never going to emotionally realize you're going to die soon. But I think by being around me during that period, it did rub off on my friendship group where I was like, we're not complaining about silly things that don't matter. Mm. So ultimately it was perspective. It was mm. context. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can imagine that was like a huge shift just like that specific time having been told this might happen and feeling like you almost like it's like that like get out of jail Mm. free feeling it's like you know being able to kind of be at that point and be like wow I actually get to experience this all the things that previously would have affected me no longer affected me Mm. so like there was a guy I was seeing through that period he ghosted me the moment I went to hospital which was great (laughs) and I would have been really upset about that before and I saw him on that night on Valentine's night and he came up to me and he said some rubbish thing about how I'd lost yeah how beautiful I was because I'd lost so much weight obviously I'd not eaten in the last six weeks because I was hooked up to a drain oh my god Um, dodged a bullet there but it didn't affect my night Mm. I was like I'm having a great night you can't affect it you don't have that power and you aren't even touching what I've just been through Mm. so like no matter how negative or horrible your comment is you're just not going to have that control over me anymore Mm. and I hate that I had to go into hospital to have that Mm. but it's a feeling that I like to return to because once you emotionally feel that you can hold on to it and use your memories in a positive way and how do you return to that feeling like how do you because I can imagine it's really easy to slip into like the everyday of kind of just Mm. you know getting used to the fact that it's you know, all the normal human things of kind of sweating the small stuff and all of that. So this is a real life coaching thing that I learned. You know how if you think about a sad memory in your life long enough, you will start feeling sad. What we don't realize is you can do the same with happy memories, but almost reverse engineer it. Go back to a time in your life when you felt most confident. I actually do this before public speaking. And I remember I did this before my TED talk, where I remember... Uh, going back to a time in my life I met, felt most confident, a time in my life I felt most calm. And when I say go back to that time, you literally imagine yourself in your body at the time, breathing how you were breathing at the time, sitting how you were sitting at the time, and actually look, look through your eyes in that moment and go into your body and feel what you are feeling in that moment. So you can borrow that confidence. And what's strange is what I used for my TED Talk was a meeting I had when I was 14 years old but I remember feeling so confident in that meeting and I went into my body at the time and I used that confidence to be confident in my TED talk but we often use it with sad memories but if you can do it with sad memories you can do it with happy memories Mm. Uh, yeah I think I think I think that's so true and what I've often thought about is that kind of the fact that if you think about something that makes you sad you will be made sad and I 
it obviously sounds so obvious when you say it, but also thinking about the fact how much you can talk those types of things into existence Mm. by, you know, as you say, borrowing stress from like another time or whatever it might be. Like every single thing you think about, your body is making, working very hard to make it happen. Whether you are talking about, you know, thinking about a time that you were anxious or thinking about the future where you think you're going to be anxious or all of those different things. And it almost kind of like making that true because your body that's the way your body reacts. It puts you in that situation. Well, I think it's also the thing of, you think of a sad memory, you not only feel sad, but your body adapts to what feeling sad looks like. So stereotypically that's hunched shoulders and all of that. But that's why the confidence things works because if you're confident, your shoulders are back, you're breathing differently, you're breathing slower. So when you go back in the memory, you actually adopt the physiology you had at the time. Mm. And if you're thinking about a sad memory and you've got the physiology of being sad, a lot of the times, those are the moments where you go, I can't remember the time in my life I was happy. It's because you're sitting literally in a sad physiology and that physiology is actually connected to your memories. So the next time you're feeling really down, go put your hands on your hips and stand with your shoulders back and then try to remember the last time you felt happy the memory will come back to you faster because you are actually standing that way when you were happy Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about self-love um I know you speak about this a lot in your work and online why do you think I guess self-criticism is so endemic in in young people now I think for a long time, we were taught to believe that if you criticize yourself, constructive criticism, it makes us better. When actually, especially when you do it to a child, it becomes their inner voice. And especially if it's coming from a main caregiver or a parent, as a child, you look at your parents as being perfect, as always being right. So if they criticize something like your body, you take that in and you decide you are wrong. And that means you lose touch with being able to trust your instinct, being able to trust your body if it's around body shame, or being able to trust even your opinions on things because mum and dad are always right and they all always know more than me. So it's not just a criticism on your homework or a criticism on the way you're dressing. It's about who you are as a human. And that's the difference between shame and guilt. So maybe if you haven't done your homework, you would feel guilt, you would feel bad about not doing your homework. But the shame is when it becomes, I'm a bad person for not doing my homework. Mm. And largely that's because you're not realizing the power dynamic between a caregiver and a child who still can't fully rely on themselves to live. So they're so reliant on you that they are so sensitive to what you say. So a lot of the time it can be something as simple as if you were around a parent who um, was very critical if you smashed a plate, for example, I'm using that example because I'm a very clumsy person and they made a big deal about it and was like, oh my God, how can you break that plate? All of that. The next time you make a simple mistake as an adult, what do you think is going through your mind? It's the voice of all the caregivers around you telling you how stupid you are, how clumsy you are, how you can't every, if you can't even hold a plate, how am I meant to trust you with X, Mm. Y, Z? And it's what is a really pivotal change as you become an adult is understanding that your inner voice is not yours. Mm. It doesn't belong to you. It's someone else who taught you that. And therefore being able to tell the difference between a positive inner voice and a negative one. And I guess on the opposite side of self-criticism, how can we, I guess, practice self-love daily? Mm. So one of the things I love is called evidences. And it's something I do at the end of every night. And it's three things. And at the moment I'm doing three things I impress myself with today but you can do whatever your insecurities around. So three reasons why I love my body today, three reasons my body got me through my day, three reasons why I was proud of myself. Whatever language resonates with you is what you should do every day, but you have to make it a habit because if you think about how many times in a day you think negatively of yourself, you have to be doing more to think positively about yourself to rewrite that. Mm, yeah, no, I can I can completely understand that. I think that it's it is very much something that you need to learn Mm. and you need to instill. I think with any other habit, we think of it as something where you need to, you know, you need to replicate it. There's what, like 66 days to make a habit or whatever it is. Mm. I think there's all different sorts of evidence, but actually we don't, you know, it's those types of things. Like if you struggle specifically with self-criticism or lack of self-worth or any of those things, just like you would any other thing, like, I don't know, it might be remembering that you wanted to go to the gym or remembering that you wanted to see your friends more or like literally whatever it might be actually doing that thing Mm. that many 
times over and over and just schedule literally scheduling it in like yeah. it's that simple I think for me one of the things that really helped was understanding that there are roughly eight, 50 to 80 thousand thoughts in a day mm. so how many of those thoughts are completely irrelevant and which ones are you attaching to is a really key thing mm. and once I realized that my thoughts aren't facts mm. it was it gave me the ability to create distance between certain thoughts. So I probably do still have bad body image thoughts because I grew up in a world that is very critical of appearances. Yeah. And But if I have a thought like, your thighs are full of cellulite, I'd be like, oh, I need to write that email um, and just move on. It takes a, a millisecond and then I'm on to the next thought because I don't put weight in it anymore. I'm like, who cares? Mm. Who cares what my thighs look like? My body isn't as important as what I have to do today. Mm. And it's going to get me there and it doesn't stop me. So mm. that's all that matters, moving on. But I think it takes, maybe took me about five years to actually stop playing into those thoughts and recognizing I had a choice as to whether I had a bad body image day. Even if I couldn't control my thoughts, I could control that it doesn't turn into my whole day. So on that point specifically, if someone was having a particularly bad body image day, what would you suggest for them to, I guess, turn that day around in terms of that bad body image specifically? So for me, body confidence is quite a lofty concept. And so the end goal for me is that you spend less time and energy thinking about what you look like throughout your day. And right. that actually, I think, is the greatest negative of being insecure about your body mm. is that you don't leave the house without triple checking your outfit, changing a few times, redoing your makeup. You're not focused in the job interview you have that day because you're thinking about what you look like. Right. And so actually realizing what is more important than your body. And I think a lot of the focus at the moment, especially within body positivity, Activity is you are so beautiful I do believe everyone is beautiful and I believe anyone who you don't think is beautiful you've just been taught to believe that they are outside the beauty yeah. ideal yeah but at the same time your body is more important what you do with your body is more important than what it looks like and I think ultimately coming back to my hospital experiences that taught me that more than anything I spent my entire adolescence years hating my body hating what I look like for the people listening who can't see right now, I have surgery scars all over my stomach. I'm half bald behind here. I have surgery scars on my ankles. I have one here that everyone confuses with the nipple. And so I grew up very insecure about what I look like. And it was only when I was about 15, I realized, you know what? There's the one grace of surgery scars is you can't do anything to change it. If I was insecure about my weight, I could have changed that. If I was insecure about my nose, I could have a plastic surgery. What, am I gonna get plastic surgery to remove surgery scars? Doesn't really make a lot of sense. And so I had to accept it. And as soon as I accepted it, I actually started putting myself forward for leadership positions in the school because I just accepted, and this isn't the most body positive thought, but I accepted I was ugly and I couldn't change it, but I could do so much more with my life. And because I had that, those two feelings in my body of, oh, I hate my body, but also I realized how short life is and I've got to make the most of life. I actually just threw myself into everything that wasn't appearance based or aesthetic space. And then over time, I learned to love the way I looked and mm. accept the way I look. But that came first. What came first is realizing I was more than a body rather than realizing I was beautiful. The realizing I was beautiful part came maybe eight years later. But right. in those eight years, I did so much with my life because I didn't let it stop me. Yeah. And I, th I mean, I think that's really, really powerful. And I... I think it's one of those things where when you really think about beauty standards and really acknowledge the fact that actually beauty standards really are a distraction. Mm. Like they are a way to distract and especially suppress women mm. who have to spend so much time adhering to beauty standards in order to be, as you know, the assumption that in order to be able to get by, you need to mm. adhere to those beauty standards, which absolutely we've had that reinforced over and over and over. We've had it reinforced that, you know, the better you look, the better you'll do, or mm. like there's all of these correlations between, you know, looks at whatever it might be. But it's, I think at the end of the day, being able to recognize, like I always say to my friends, like how you look is the least interesting thing about you. Mm. Like none of us are friends with you because of how you look. You might be the most beautiful person in the world by our beauty standard. Yeah. And I'm not here because you look nice. Absolutely. Like I'm here because of every single other part of you. And I would rather how you look change before I would like before any single other part of you change. Mm. And I think when you start to really internalize and I think it naturally happens as we grow up, but it is it is really hard because it is everywhere, especially for women, that we have to be beautiful, but not just that we have to be beautiful, that we have to upkeep in all of these various different ways. It is a distraction. Yeah. And it is a distraction sent 
to like it, the whole beauty myth thing. Like mm. it's a distraction sent to suppress and distract. And it sounds all like conspiracy theory, but actually if you really think about it, it's like, yeah, sure, it's better if we spend all of this time concentrating on our looks. And it might sound like a conspiracy theory, but I think most of the world can understand that money runs the world. Think about how much money are in those industries. I think the diet industry is something like 16, mm. 16 billion. I want to say billion, maybe a million. No, I have to check that for It will definitely be a billion. Um, but the, the amount of money behind it, it makes sense. And you cannot profit off someone loving themselves. You can profit off someone hating themselves and selling them cellulite products and selling them new tanning products and actually just thinking about how many hours in a week that a woman is spending on their manicure, their pedicure, their haircut, their tanning regime, their waxing, all of that that men don't have to do or even I mean this is just a joke but I do tend to say it quite a lot I don't wear heels I've not worn heels in 10 years and I say I think it's purposely created to slow women down <laughs> well I'm a very fast walker so I probably need heels to just like you know stop me a little bit so I can stop chasing everyone yeah. down the street yeah no I think it is really really interesting when you think about it like that and I think then there also comes the shame after that point when you still adhere to those beauty standards or mm. attempt to fulfill them because I think it is such a natural I mean we're you know we're pack animals we want to we want to impress we want to feel good about ourselves we want to feel like we are kind of you know doing well in mm. in all aspects including how we look and I think that's really tough too because obviously that kind of plays into it and then you're very aware of the fact that you might be doing xyz for the male gaze like I would love to say that I do it all for the female gaze I don't like I don't think when you re when it really comes down to it like there's it's so much more complex than that but then there comes like the guilt of also still doing the things it might be shaving it might yeah. be makeup it might be any of these different things and what's really strange is when you think you're about to die everyone um especially in the movies they have this reel of like all the big moments in your life. And actually that wasn't what was going through my head for six weeks. What was going through my head for six weeks was a memory where my friends had gone to dance class and I had said no, because I didn't want to be the fat girl in dance class. And it's so small and it's so insignificant. But for some reason, I was like, what I would give right now to go to dance class, what I would give right now to see my friends. And after that, I made a promise that I was like, I'm, my body is doing its damnedest to try to keep me alive. The least I could do is try to help it and support it. And I'm never going to say no to living my life anymore simply mm. because of what I look like. And I think that actually is the biggest shift for body confidence is your body has no power over dictating what you do in your life if you decide you're going to go do it anyway. I want to talk about dating for a yeah. second. I know you speak a lot about the um, how much the dating world, I guess, has changed and mm. the move to apps and all of that. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about your kind of view on dating apps. Yeah, so uh, for years, I actually didn't talk about my love life online. Like I would talk about life coaching and body image and all of the things. And love life was the one thing I didn't mention. And then I kind of had a moment where I was a bit frustrated with the fact that anytime I would sit on a panel, the only questions around dating that I would be asked were negative assumptions. So either around me being plus size or mixed race and being fetishized or the fact that I have a chronic illness and how difficult that is to date. Right. And then the other people on my panel would be asked oh, I like the positive experience, the good stories. And I was like, okay, but you didn't ask me that question. So I can't yeah. tell you Do my Do not assume story. that I could have had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the world does that, doesn't yeah, it? The no, world it really goes does. like, you're plus size, you're mixed race, you're half bald, you're, you've got a chronic illness, you're going to have a tough time dating. That's going to limit your dating pool. But no one ever stopped to actually ask me, do I like them back? And so it was this moment where I was like, well, I do have a great love life. I have a right. great dating life. I was single for eight years and I went on so many dates and had the best time. And I was like, I want to talk about it just if only for the only reason that it's positive representation that you can look like me, i.e. I do think I'm beautiful, but outside of the beauty ideal and have an amazing love life. And I, that's kind of what led to my book, The Selfish Romantic, was that I was like, it's proof that actually this idea that the way you look limits your dating pool. Well, if you're into festivals, that also limits your dating pool. I don't want to date someone who goes to festivals. If you're vegan, that limits your dating pool. I'm a foodie and I like trying all kinds of restaurants. There are so many other elements that limit your dating pool, but the danger with saying something like around someone's appearance that is a permanence that they can't change is people believe it. Mm. And so I... 
it was starting to look at my love life a different way because going into dating when I was younger with that mentality, especially because when I started dating was really the start of online dating. The danger with that was that you you have this mentality that beggars can't be choosers, that you've got to settle with whoever lands in your lap. And unfortunately, most of the time that leads to really negative situations and actually more times than not emotionally abusive situations because if you're in a situation where you will take what however they behave or however they treat you people tend to keep going down that path and Mm. you you don't believe you can find better because you've been told that the way you are means you can't find someone else so you need to stick with your only option and what's even more insidious than that is that they are a saint for loving you at your size they are a saint for loving you uh especially through your chronic illness that you are a burden if you have a chronic illness and what I mean my boyfriend's still I, I'm now in a relationship and my boyfriend now still gets that to the day wow you go with Michelle to her MRIs like the yeah bar is hell <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry did you think I would be in a two-year relationship with a guy who didn't come with me to the hospital like it's it's also a it's a really messed up message that because I have a chronic illness, it's a one way love. And it's not, I turn up for him for different things. It might not be illness, but everyone is difficult to date. Yeah. Everyone just has a different issue, whether it's and you also everything's through. relative, like. Exactly. And also it shouldn't feel like a big deal if mm. you love the person. And I think framing a lot of these, what people like to say minorities, but if you actually put them together, it is the majority. Everyone is going through something. And all of these things as, Um, inconveniences or things that are going to make people want to date you less is just such a horrible and frankly mean message Mm. and I think that's where my passion comes from talking about online dating because I know it's boring being on dating apps but my comparison is when people run a business no one tells you how much they love sending invoices they love getting paid so you send the invoice if you want to date you want to go on a date you want to love dating you've got to go on the dating app that's the admin side of it and one of the first tips I give anyone who's going out there before you even start dating is write a hundred reasons why someone would want to date you you need to know what you bring to the table so that someone else can't walk in the room and tell you who you are because you need to know who you are exactly and if someone walked into my life and treated me like I wasn't good enough I would be able to go off the top of my head well, I have this and I do this and I'm this kind of person. And that's why I am a valuable person today. And if you're not going to treat me the way I deserve, then I'm going to go find that from someone else. Yeah, or it's just not a good match. I feel like this is the whole thing. It's the same with jobs. It's the same with dating. It's the same with all of these things. The chances that you are going to meet someone and you actually be a good match are Mm. lower than the other way around. And I think we have this perception that it's going to be you know, that it's more likely that you do meet someone that you get on with or whatever it might be. Like, why would that be the case? Like that makes absolutely zero sense. And actually it's a, it's a almost like a, you know, as you say, the a hundred reasons why someone should date you. They also have a hundred reasons why someone should date them perfect if those also align and in terms of like what you want from each other the chances of that happening are Mm. slimmer than we expect in terms of or not slimmer than we expect but slimmer than we give credit for when we're upset that one date didn't work if that makes sense and I think it's all about also like realigning and understanding the probability of that and then being able to you know we always get told like if you knew you had to fail 99 times before you succeeded yeah. you would be happy with each failure because you'd know that you were one step closer same with dates like if you knew you had to go on nine dates to meet that 10th person yeah. it was going to be great you would be happy with each one of those nine going wrong because you're getting closer but it is that type of you know it's that I think we all rational rationalize dating before we do it and then when you're dating it's so easy to kind of like unravel because it's easy to get a bad day when you suddenly feel like oh well, actually, no, they're yeah. right. I'm not worth it. But you've got to stay robust. Yeah. And also one of the pieces of the puzzle is that when you go on a good first date and then they don't call you back, you see that as a failure. So it's what you're describing as failure that's creating this mentality in your head. But if you had a really nice evening out, maybe you tried a new restaurant together or you went to go see a film that you actually wanted to see together. Why is that a failure? Mm. If you walked away from that day learning something new about someone and maybe they've taught you more about bouldering was one of the dates I remember he taught me so much about bouldering and I knew nothing about bouldering how is that a failure if you walked away from the date going oh I realized I actually wouldn't be a good match with someone who's that active and wants to go on like trekking adventures 
How is that a failure? You've learned mm. something new about your dating life. And so I think lowering the bar of what's considered a failure, but also just walking into the dates with natural curiosity, where you don't have to love the person. You don't have to like the person. Just be curious about the person in front of you. And I mm. genuinely believe that you can learn from every single person mm. you interact with, but you have to be curious enough to actually ask the questions. And I think that's where if you go on a on three first dates and they don't turn into something, if you're going on with a different intention and the intention isn't just get a, a, a official label out of it, a girlfriend, boyfriend label or whatever. And instead it's the intention of, on this day, I want to ask more questions. On this day, I want to be 10% more myself. On this day, I actually want to show up with no makeup and see how that makes me feel. You can actually improve your dating life in a way that a lot of people don't. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of the time when people go, oh, I want to date more, I want to get more matches, the first thing they do is think of an aesthetic change. Oh, this is why I need to wear more makeup. This is why I need to get a new outfit. No one actually thinks about the personal development that's required to find a romantic match. Mm -hmm. And it's going back to what you said that if you think about a room of 100 people, how many in that room would you even want to be friends with? Okay, and how many out of your friends that you currently have can you travel with and live with? For me, it's about two of my friends who mm. I've been on holiday with and we've not ended in a massive fight. Now, thinking about the sexual element, the romantic element, adding that onto how hard it is to find a friend you can live with and travel with, that's how hard it is to find a romantic partner. Mm. And how I think that's incredibly true. And I think that's also useful when you're thinking of like rationalizing why something might not work out and not getting upset about it. I also can see how that would be quite depressing in a way because it's like, okay, that's how hard it is. Mm. What would, advice would you give to someone who's been dating and is so fed up mm. and just like wants to stop dating would ideally, you know, is has been dating for a relationship and would ideally find that. What advice would you give someone in terms of like keeping on going? I would actually tell you not to. I didn't date for three years in mm. my single period of mm. eight years of being single. I didn't go on a date for three years. I was very focused on my career. That's all I cared about. It was the thing that was making me happiest in the world. And the only, I realized the only reason I was dating is because I was feeling that pressure when people asked me if I'd been on a date to actually have an answer. And actually, if you are sick of dating, you going on more dates with that feeling in your body is not going to lead to success. And you need to actually feel positive, optimistic, and curious about dates. Mm. Otherwise, don't bother. Mm. Ha take, give yourself permission to take a break, but also you're allowed to feel that disappointment. So the piece around understanding how hard it is to find a romantic match is important because it's also reframing what a lot of people see as rejection as not rejection. So if someone matches you and then you don't end up going on the date, you don't have to see that as rejection because they, they don't even know you. That's a stranger. Yeah. So reduce the amount of rejection that's coming into your life. But then the second part is if, if you feel rejected, let's say you went on four dates and you feel really hurt. This narrative in your head of, oh, it's only four dates. I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't feel so attached. Why am I so, like, why am I attaching to guys so quickly? And then beating yourself up for having feelings with a human that you actually interacted with. Yeah. There have been days I have cried over a guy I have never met because I was excited <laughs> for the date. Yeah, it's the Let, potential. It's not yeah, the, it's yeah. the potential. It's whatever the buildup was that day specifically. I remember it was my first day after the pandemic. So I was really looking forward to it. I'd been alone during lockdown. I was looking forward to seeing a human. And I just let myself cry. You're not weak for crying. And I think this mentality of don't let them see you cry or they can't know how much they've affected you. The only person you're hurting by pretending those feelings don't exist is yourself. Mm -hmm. And by denying those feelings exist, it doesn't make the feelings go away. It just makes it worse. And that's when resentment around dating builds up. And so if you want to have a cry, I don't care how many dates you've been on. I don't care if it was one night stand or whether you never met the guy. If you want to cry, cry, let yourself hurt and actually comfort yourself in the same compassionate way you would do to a child where you would say, hey, this is okay. Look, I know you were really excited. I know you were looking forward to the date. There will be another date, but for right now, you can just feel this. It's okay to feel that heartbreaking and you'll feel okay tomorrow and then you can go on another date. Mm, but you yeah. don't need to rush that process. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's a very, very good point. And what advice would you give to someone who's struggling with their self-worth in general and is also actively dating and finds those two things hard to balance because obviously you do face 
more rejection than you probably would otherwise when yeah. you're putting yourself in front of strangers. Like you'd feel the same if you were trying to be friends with everyone. So I think, especially when you're outside of the beauty ideal, it's this idea that like you're not getting as many matches as other people. But I use the analogy of if you got a hundred emails into your inbox every day hmm. and you were only going to reply to two anyway, that's the difference between being in the beauty ideal and not being in the beauty ideal. So you might only be getting two, but then you're getting two you're interested in. Whereas the person within the beauty ideal is getting a hundred and having to sift through the hundred to get two. More admin. More admin. <laughs> but also, if you don't have the correct filters for getting rid of the idiots in the room, then the person with the beauty ideal is going to have the same problem as you. And so... I always say there's that saying, which is like, the people you attract are a reflection of you. And I think it's such a shaming quote. So what I say instead is the people you keep is a reflection of you because everyone dates dickheads. Everyone dates people who treat them awfully. The trick is to get rid of them faster and to know that you don't deserve to be treated that mm. way. So having that piece of self-worth and knowing what your boundaries are and actually being able to stand up for yourself and go. So it's around simple things and boundaries are one of those things that people think, especially in dating, oh, we're not serious enough for me to set my boundaries. Boundaries are there with everyone and you should be setting it from the get-go. So the first date, they plan a date that's five minutes around from their house and two hours away from you. Hey, no, unfortunately that's not gonna work for me. Let's find somewhere so somewhere in the middle. If they text you two o'clock in the morning from the get-go, hey, this is not an appropriate time to text. I'll reply to you when I finish work tomorrow. You actually setting those boundaries of what's convenient for you, what works for you, because why are you putting them as a priority in your schedule when again, they're still a stranger and they haven't earned that right. So how would you recommend someone sets boundaries when they're dating? So it is saying those small things, starting with where they choose the restaurant, where how they reply. Um, I remember with my boyfriend, the second day we were texting, he texted me at like 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm too busy during the workday to text. And so I replied to him at six o'clock and I was like, hey, I don't text during the workday, but feel free to text me and I'll reply as soon as I'm off work. And so I set that boundary. Now, over time, he earned his trust. He earned my respect. And he also earned just more more interest I guess and I did reply to him during working hours mm. but that took a few months and if he turned up late or if um I found he was disrespecting my time I would communicate that I think it's that that difference between when you feel something you thinking oh if I stay quiet about this I will be more dateable and they'll like me more and actually realizing if you show them that in the beginning then you'll know sooner rather than later whether they are the right person for you. Yeah, I always think it's so interesting because I do think we're really taught, especially as women, I mean, we are definitely taught mm. to be the cool girl. Like we're always taught to be as cool and chilled as possible and to let as much slide because that's more dateable. Mm. And it is such a myth. Like not only is it harmful, it's yeah. also a myth. And like, that is probably one of the things that I really wish I knew earlier. Mm. Not because I am not happy that everything's worked out how, how it yeah. has. I like, I very, very, very much am. But I think it's so interesting because I think I spent well, like definitely over 10 years pretending to be the cool girl or pretending to be fine with things that I was actually bulldozing my boundaries. Yeah. And actually then just feeling like, well, that's fine. I'm basically doing my time to be more dateable. Mm. And actually just realizing that not only is it entirely inappropriate not to set your own boundaries because you're basically disrespecting yourself. It's also untrue because you make yourself harder to date because you're mm. not clarifying exactly what is within your boundaries. And you're also taking, if it's not gonna work out, it's not gonna work out. Yeah. You'd rather know sooner rather than later. And that comes by setting your boundaries. I think all of the problems, like when I was younger and would have relationships and then like over time, I'd be more and more kind of like saying, okay, no, this isn't okay. Yeah. I knew it wasn't okay at the beginning, but yeah. it's like, we are literally like, as women, we are raised to be the cool girl. Yeah. And because if you don't behave that way, you will be stigmatized in society using words like she's really harsh in the mm. workplace. She's really difficult or, um, oh, she's tough. Like all of those those words I mean there are worse words I could use but probably not on the mm. podcast which are used against women and I think this idea that I was always taught oh men don't like opinionated women yeah or like difficult women yeah and sorry but like, oh that's, that's me out the window <laughs> that actually does them such an injustice men yeah, are not no, a monolith agreed. there are men who won't like opinionated mm. women but how am I going to find a man who likes an opinionated woman if I stop being an opinionated woman so it is that thing where 
you have to understand that if they disappear because you've set a boundary, then that's a good thing. And actually you want those boundaries from the get-go because what's worse is people have this idea of, I'm going to be this easy breezy, cool, low maintenance girl. And then I'm going to hook them with a relationship and then the mask will drop and I'll show them all my boundaries. Except you've now set a precedent for a relationship without boundaries. And that person is now waking up going, who the hell is this person? Yeah, I've both never of you met are confused. Them. Yeah. yeah. And so I would even go as, so, as far as to say that people pleasing can be quite manipulative. If you look at the definition of manipulation, it is the definition of trying to, of changing yourself in order to get an outcome. And that's what you're doing. You're trying to get a relationship regardless of who you are or how you have to be. You are going to do that in order to get that hook, that hook, that relationship in. When rather I know on a first date that actually me going, hey, it's unacceptable that you were late for, at, late for an hour. I left 20 minutes ago. But if you want to go on a date again, then you need to book it ensure that you are on time and I'll meet you there. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's so true. I mean, I, it took me so long. I'm anything but the cool girl in every single other part of my life. Mm -hmm. And it took me so long to learn within dating that it was not only untrue, yeah. but also actually just not helping myself. I genuinely had the perception that it helps you to be the cool girl. And it is so incorrect. Like it could not harm you and whatever prospects you might have in terms of like what's the right fit more yeah. because I am I don't know if anyone's ever heard me talk or ever been in a room with me I am so far from like a cool unopinionated person you can possibly imagine and what's the, what's the end goal like I'm gonna date this person they're gonna like me enough we're gonna be in a relationship and then we're gonna be there and they're gonna be like fuck I've got the most opinionated person I could possibly imagine and we're both just sat here like great like brilliant yeah. and I don't know why it takes I don't know why it takes everyone so long I mean I do it's because it's constantly sold to us in the media and in general life and actually it, it helps the patriarchy in general yeah. to think that you know we need fewer opinions but I do I always think about it because I remember always saying like when you know I'd have a dating disaster or whatever it would be and I'd be like but I was so chilled and mm. I was so tolerant and like all of this and it's like, oh, why was that a good thing? Yeah. Because there's no boundary set, no boundaries reached and everyone's confused. Yeah. And then also when it comes to things like chronic illness, it's this messaging that, oh, I need to hide it mm. because that's what makes me more dateable. And I need to hide my surgery scars, which led to me being a 19 year old blurting out about my surgeries on the way home because it was like the third day I was going home with mm. him. And was like, oh no, he doesn't know about my surgery scars because I've right. hidden it the whole time. Um, and it's, it's realizing that actually all of these things which people tell you make you difficult to date aren't a big deal to the right person. Mm. And if you set a boundary around, I remember there was a guy who was really late at all the time. And the, after the first time I was like, it's fine. The second time I was like, no, this is unacceptable. Unfortunately, communication is really important to me. And if you don't have that, that's not uh, someone I'm willing to date. Take care, hope you find what you're looking for. Mm. and. I showed a friend that text and then she was like, you can't say that. And I was like, why can't I say that? And she was like, because, because it's just too harsh. It's too blunt. And I actually made her go through the text and I was like, what sentence in here is harsh and blunt? Because it's not, it's just direct. But the reason why women have been trained to communicate indirectly is because when we communicate directly, we're called all those names. So what happens instead is we have this stereotype of women gossiping behind someone's back or saying something in a passive aggressive tone or the stereotype of a mum who's loaded the dishwasher for the 10th time that day and gone, fine, no one's gonna help me passive aggressively because she's not felt she could actually communicate the boundary of, hey, this is the communal dishwasher, everyone needs to be pitching in. Mm. So I will not be up unloading the dishwasher anymore and you all can sort out a schedule. Mm. And se setting that boundary is direct communication. It's not passive aggressive. But this is why we focus too much on women are bitchy, women are passive aggressive, but no one's actually focusing on why they feel like they can't communicate the other way. That's so interesting. I'd never really thought about the passive aggressive point. I mean, I'm very much, you know, aware of direct women are <laughs> generally mm. not appreciated for many, many different ways. But even just thinking about that as the passive aggression as a direct 
kind of result of that. Or within friendship, the mode that's usually used is jokes that aren't really jokes. Right. And that can really hurt. Which is really interesting because I think I've been around a lot of passive aggression and I like always like was growing up. And then I've grown up and I've realized like I'm quite a direct person Mm. and have had to like grow out of that. And I think a lot of people around me who I also grow up with are also, but it's that, you know, it's seen as polite. It's Mm. definitely seen as like, especially with women, you cannot be direct in that way. You have to be a lot more passive, a lot more polite in the way you say it. And even sometimes like the way my boyfriend will say things to I don't know it might be like something he's someone he's working with it's not impolite at all and it will just be like yeah no I need it like this and I'll be like oh god you've got to add on the beginning be like hey so that's so I'm great wondering. I actually would love to have it like this love it how like and all of this and I'm like you've never thought about that because mm-hmm. like that's so normal and I would also receive that from a man and be like yep yeah, cool no got to do that and it's so funny how we have to unlearn that all ourselves yeah. in terms of being like that's again it's not just incorrect it's also unhelpful to yeah. both people in the scenario because it's indirect and everyone has to read between the lines and no one can tell whether you're actually angry or you're not angry and i hate passive aggression now mm. i will instantly say if one of my friends says something i'll be like whoa yeah I'll be like should we talk about it or are yeah. we gonna keep firing in directs at each other or whatever it might be and it's so my interesting. favorite one is the word ouch so this is one of my favorite boundaries if someone says something passive aggressive or makes a joke that isn't a joke i'll, I'll just say ouch And then if they don't say anything, I'm like, is there something you're upset about that you would like to talk about? Because I'm not going to play these mind games. And I think you, everyone has to remember, you're not a mind reader. I don't know why you're upset. And one of the best gifts of boundaries is that it simplifies your life. Mm. I do not spend my time and energy now wondering whether my friends are angry with me because I know they have the confidence to be able to speak to me and tell me if they're angry because I tell them when I'm angry. Yeah. And I don't have to question whether I've annoyed them or that comment was a little bit off. But that comes from me having my boundaries and therefore they feel the permission to have theirs. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the exact same in relationships too. Like there've definitely been so many relationships where I've been like very passive aggressive mm. purely because I felt I, I felt like I had to be too cool to be able to express myself properly. Yeah. And again, then it just, it eats away. Like it's really, really tough to be around someone passive aggressive. And it's really tough to be the person being passive aggressive, feeling like you're not being heard because yeah. you are not saying it in a way that is understandable. But also it's because passive aggression was the language I was taught. So yeah. the biggest hurdle I have when setting boundaries was word for word, how do I actually put that into a sentence, especially in dating? Cause I was the same as you. Dating was the last area where my boundaries came into place. Like. I I had boundaries in all the other parts. Mm-hmm. There was definitely parts of the internet still calling me queen of boundaries. And I was like, not really in my life. like, whoa, life. I'm being walked all over over here. <laughs> I was like, I didn't really set my boundary on the last date. But it was the last area that came. And it was me sitting with my own life coach and going, how do I say that? And her saying, and this is going to sound so silly, but she said, this doesn't work for me. And I was like, you can't say that. And I was so scared to say that simple sentence. It's one of my favorite sentences now. But it I don't know why it was just the word like obviously I know English obviously I know language but to put those words together in a sentence were just a novel idea to me that I hadn't thought to do and that is a sentence that I ended up using most in my dating life also saying communication is really important to me and if that isn't within our relationship then this is not going to work um and also it is having that thing where you're willing to say goodbye to something that isn't working and Mm. if they can't communicate in the early stages of relationship the likelihood is they can't communicate in the later stages i'm not a big red flag and run person but uh, I do believe you give someone a warning, you set a boundary, you reinforce the boundary in case the boundary is broken. And then if they're repeating that behavior and there is no behavior change, you need to listen to the evidence, not the words they're saying. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And I also think that red flags are so different. There are, there are some blanket red flags. There are definitely some blanket red flags. But I also think that, you know, there are some people that communication isn't actually held highly mm-hmm. and they are, you know, they might not be that anxious a person in their mind and therefore they're happy to go around their whole day and they will never spend one thought thinking, I wonder if, you know, everything's yeah. okay there or whatever it might be. And I think that it's just one of those things, again, I always thought about, um, you know, as as being someone who definitely set like my boundaries late in dating, despite being very good at setting boundaries in lots of other areas, is the fact that actually you think about that like red flag thing and a few things coming up and you setting boundaries and like whether they react to it and all of this as like an extra thing that you're accidentally tripping them up on mm-hmm. rather than it being like, oh no, because this is how you deal with, you'll deal with problems for the rest of your relationship. Yeah. Like, 
with my relationship now, like I've literally, you know, anytime we've had an argument and I've talked to my friends about it or whatever it might be. And then I've been like the best part of this relationship. And this sounds like the bar is so low. It's, it's not, I have a, <laughs> I, I have a high bar. Um, the like things that are brought up change. Yeah. Like they change on the first try mm. and they're done. And like, that's, that's something I have literally to an extent, like never experienced in the same way before. And I actually just think that that's probably because at the dating stage, yeah. it wasn't established like but that. But you say the bar is so low. You said it twice now. I just want to pick up on it because I think it's something that uh, the internet makes us feel shame about. And it's actually just nonsense. So I have to say something Yeah, no, go it. ahead. It's the fact that it was one day I posted about how my boyfriend always makes me a cup of tea. I can't remember the last time I made a cup of tea. And I said, every time he makes a cup of tea, I say thank you. And the whole comment section is, the bar is so low. Like, that's bare minimum. You can't even find yourself a guy who makes you a cup of tea. Sorry, but if you take that small action for granted, you will take the rest of the relationship for granted. And that's how you lead to a long-term relationship where the most com- the most comments you make to each other are criticism and not appreciation. It is very easy to forget about the small cup of tea that a guy makes, but actually day to day, the impact of that on a healthy relationship is such a positive. Oh yeah, you should absolutely be saying thank you if anyone does anything for you. And I do think that when, when we diminish these bare minimum things, mm. it's like, well, if it was such a bare minimum, then no, everyone wouldn't be talking right, about it. Right, why are we all it? struggling with yeah. it? Yeah, and yeah. I just think we there are some of these um, love life things, especially online, that have started being toxic, which is why I said I'm not pro red flags because it's this mentality that like, red flag, break up with them. How about red flag, communicate that you didn't like that behavior. You reinforce that behavior when they break that boundary, which usually people do at least once because mm. they aren't clear on what the boundary specifically is. And then if the behavior continues, then break up. But a lot of the time, this fear around bare minimum, and this fear around red flags is actually someone not being that person who's saying it, having a fear around not making themselves vulnerable enough to have the hard conversation yeah and i think that's the point that you hit on is that with your your partner you can have those hard conversations but it's not just a conversation Mm. it's the behavior change after and it's the same thing with my boyfriend it was the first relationship where i didn't have to repeat myself twice right and it's such an important thing and it's not bare minimum it's not a low bar yeah because most people are just listening yeah to get the conversation over with yeah actually you're so right and that whole kind of because when I even say it I'm like oh my boyfriend listens to me and I'm like wow (laughs) you know like slow clap yeah Um, but I do think you know you're absolutely right if it's such if it's something that's so easy then why are we all struggling with it and why in you know many relationships before have I found it really hard to set boundaries and then things will only come out in a huge argument Mm. rather than being like oh no that's you know as you said that doesn't work for me yeah um and actually being able to have those conversations and that is actioned yeah. and never, you know like and and done and actually it was probably because I wasn't able to set those boundaries before yeah. that also meant that you know it's also hard to be able to establish when something is done or not because you haven't even been clear about where the boundary is yeah and you say the thing about like your boyfriend listens to you like oh that's a bare minimum but like it's just a piece <laughs> in the puzzle like all of them are just pieces in the puzzle <laughs> he's but gonna then- be like I do so <laughs> No, I know, but no, I'm not saying you personally. I'm saying much more. No, no, more no, no, no. I that know, as, no, I know. As an internet culture, we pick apart every piece in the puzzle and go, oh, that's bare minimum. But as a accumulation, it's not bare minimum because otherwise this wouldn't be the guy you choose. Yeah. Do you get what I mean? Like yeah, if yeah, the guy no, only right. actually did the cup of tea, but then didn't bother to turn up on our dates or sure, just cups me, of tea. Like just cups <laughs> just of, a the cup of tea every three yeah. weeks. Of course I wouldn't be interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just think it's, it then leads to people getting to relationships and dismissing the small things. And actually, I think when it comes to long-term relationships, the small things matter. And those small things cannot be dismissed continuously because then the thing that will be emphasized is the moments where you're criticizing each other or you're pointing out the one thing they do wrong rather than the one thing they do right. If you want someone to do more of what you already like, you compliment what they do right, not just the thing that you want them Mm. to change. Yeah, you're so right. What I do think is bare minimum while we're on the topic is the um, amount of reels I've seen on my feed at the moment of people being like, when your husband looks after the baby for the morning. <laughs> oh, that. Yeah, well, that's just misogyny. So, <laughs> that, or like, absolutely. The, 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 like, 
or when the husband's your... babysitting. And it's like, what? You can't His babysit own your own child. I totally agree with you on that. You definitely I just got... keep seeing them pop up. And I saw one the other day being like, when you don't have to write your your husband a manual for when he's looking after your I saw that one. child. And I was like, a so manual? I think there is I a difference. I don't write my dog sitter a manual. I think there's a difference between a bare minimum and also settling. And I think it's leading right. back to that thing that I said about especially if you are in a minority you get convinced that you have to settle for these things because the world is not your oyster like someone who lives in the beauty ideal but actually it's about what um it's sometimes when you look at the bigger picture of like oh I want to be able to date people it's too overwhelming break it down to boundaries of like see a behavior you don't like correct the behavior you don't like those people will weed themselves out already you don't have to look at the bigger picture but where a lot of people who have been told oh if you're a certain race or you're a certain size or you're a certain ability you're going to find it hard to date right when you're on a dating app what they do is they reject themselves mm. so they see someone who maybe fits the beauty ideal and they go oh well they wouldn't be interested in me because they've bought the narrative that society has told them and i would just love much more positive representation for all kinds of people and that it's possible to fall in love no matter what you look like there is someone who will find you attractive and who will see the thing that you view as making you difficult to love mm. as the easiest thing in the world yeah no i think that's so true do you think too many people are settling when it comes to dating and relationships I think there are a lot of people who don't have their self-worth in place and they don't, the reason why people settle is because they don't know there is a person out there who exists, who will actually treat them the way they deserve. And what usually is the reason why they stay in that relationship is because there's so much fear mongering around being single. As I said, I was single for eight years. And can you imagine the comments I got during those eight years? Like, oh, you sh you're just too picky or you're looking too hard. So you can mm. never win. You're either looking too hard or not looking hard enough. Right, sure. And I think actually being okay with being single is a really pivotal part of knowing you aren't settling in a relationship. Right. Because otherwise you will settle for the first person who walks in the door mm -hmm. because you don't like your own company. Mm -hmm. And if the worst thing in the world is I end up forever alone, then I end up forever with me and I like me. So that's okay. Whereas if you think, oh, I'm going to be left with myself and I don't even like being alone and I have 50 best friends because I never want to even sit in my, my apartment by myself, then of course you're going to run to anyone as company. But for you to actually have standards and criteria and for you to look at, do you like them? Not just do they like you? You have to know what you deserve. And that ultimately comes down to knowing the difference between being lonely and alone. And being in a relationship will not fix your loneliness. There are people in a relationship who are lonely because they are not being understood by their partner, who, are, who walk through the world as if they're a single anyway, but just have their partner in their life because they feel they need that to match yeah. what society tells them they should be, especially around age. If you're a certain age and single, or if you're a certain, uh, if or if you're single at for a certain length of time, they've been told you're too single, you're, you've are you been alone for too long, all of those things. And actually, if you're happy in your life, that's all that should matter. Mm, yeah, no, I think that's incredibly true. And what would you recommend to someone who is struggling and they know they're struggling with settling and generally going for the first person who walks through the door or the first kind of like semi good date they have? What would you say to someone in terms of advice in order to be able to stop settling? So I think it starts with that first date where you go on the date with the intention to impress them. Start letting them impress you. So what are you looking for in a person? And actually go on the date and ask yourself whether that is a person you would be proud of to introduce, someone you would actually respect. And if you show up as yourself, even if it's, I said previously, showing up 10% more yourself, I know there's this like wishy-washy thing of be yourself, but actually, you know there are moments where you've been inaccurate, you've exaggerated something to be more impressive. Actually taking just 10% on a date to try to be more you and show maybe the nerdy side of you that you're insecure about, or if it's something physical, turning up on a date without makeup and actually letting yourself do that vulnerability and show yourself actually this isn't the worst thing in the world because I think a lot of the times we have these negative what ifs of 
people are going to reject me to my face or especially when I, ha- I was insecure about my surgery scars I genuinely thought I would take my top off and people would run screaming from the room when- <laughs> because of my surgery scars but that whole narrative was created right, in my head yeah, because of, of my own insecurity and so actually the only way I got through it and improved my point of view around my scars was by taking my top off without feeling like I had to give a disclaimer right at all explain my surgery scars and it took everything in me to like keep the words in my mouth and not say anything. Yeah. And I, I was probably really awkward at the time. And I was probably that specific situation. He probably thought like she's acting a bit weird. But the next time I <laughs> yeah, was more comfortable. Yeah. It's only difficult once. The first time you do it is difficult. And then it gets easier. Same with setting boundaries. The first time you say, hey, that's not going to work for me. It's difficult. You might throw your phone across the room and put it on airplane mode and not want to check it. But I I specifically did that the first time I sent a breakup text because I because I never I believed in that like beggars can't be choosers I never ended it so with the first the first guy I ever broke up with was a really decent guy he was a great guy I just wasn't interested and that was enough it I didn't he didn't have to be an awful guy mm. for me not to be interested but I was so scared I sent the text while I was on the tube and I was going into a TEDx You're like, meeting. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, well, okay, I can't be distracted during my TEDx preparation meeting. So I said to on the tube, put on airplane mode. And then I, I it clearly connects, connects to the Wi-Fi in between getting to the meeting and the tube and the text came through and it was a positive text and it was a positive reply and it's the first time I've ever rejected a man and got a positive reply. And I was like, it was this really reaffirming moment of, oh, wow, I'm dating a different quality of human now. Right. Like, I said I'm not interested anymore and he didn't return with abuse. He returned actually with a really nice compliment about how, like, I'm really inspiring and my career is great. And I did put that text in in my book. And a lot of people have responded to that going, oh, you should have given him another chance. And I was like, this is where it goes back to bare right, minimum. Yeah, yeah. Because I was like, a nice reply is actually what you should expect. Yeah. And we've got so normalized to pe- that people respond with abuse or hurtful comments when you reject them that this is now the unicorn in the pile when actually that doesn't make us a match just because he replied to it kindly. Mm, yeah, no, you're so right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. You have been absolutely amazing. I feel like I've had like a boundaries, like, <laughs> you know, like a little boot camp on it, which I feel like is always very necessary and always a very reaffirming. But thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and your wisdom. Um, I think a lot of people will really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>